Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Welcome back to There's No Business Like. I'm Josh, and I'm here with my friends, Brian. Hey, Josh. Brian Zelmer, director of KU Presents. Katie. Hi, everyone. Katie Miller, senior manager of community engagement at the Midland Center for the Arts. Danielle. Oh, hey. It's Danielle Van Hook from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. And Kevin. Kevin Maynard, executive director of Quad City Arts. Today, I've got a question for you before we get into the episode. What is your favorite concert that you've been to? Last year, I saw the Flowbots in a small venue in St. Louis. Um, they are a band I really enjoy. Um, not my favorite band, but because it was such an intimate environment and like, uh, that was, it was one of the most high energy shows that I have ever seen and would love to experience it again. It, it, this is a really hard question because there's, there's just so many great ones, but I'd have to probably go back to one of my first concerts and it was at my favorite venue and that would be REM at Red Rocks in, uh, Colorado. Oh, wow. That was an awesome, awesome show. Red Rocks is actually my favorite concert as well. I saw Stevie Nicks at Red Rocks, and I honestly wasn't a huge Stevie Nicks fan beforehand, but I was in Denver for a conference, and she was at Red Rocks that night, so I went, and it was incredible. And it, and it had more to do with the venue and the environment than it did the concert. I mean, she was amazing, but just that atmosphere is incredible. I agree, Brian. It is really hard to choose a favorite. And like, I was like blessed with concerts um, when I worked at Wolf Trap, but like the ones that really like stick out to me are Meatloaf. That... No. Okay. I was going to say Meatloaf, but that really wasn't my favorite. <laughs> it would have been my favorite. I saw Michelle Branch. She was like one of my like girl idols growing up. And um, I had like had her album on. It felt like something that like I needed to do. Um, I also saw Kesha. <laughs> that was... It was just so fun. I wish I had been with you at that Kesha concert. That would have Listen, been amazing. It was. I could relive that <laughs> lifetimes over. It was Love that. wonderful. I have to agree. I have so many wonderful ones. Um, but I think from like an artistic and just like experiential point of view, I saw Jane Monheit, who's my favorite jazz artist at St. Cecilia Music Center in Grand Rapids. And I've loved Jane since I was in high school and like picked up her album like on a CD in a bookstore when I was in high school and was just obsessed with that album for such a long time. And she came to St. Cecilia and I went by myself to go see her and yeah, like so magical. So I bring up favorite concert because our guest this week is Neil Murray. He was the head of the National Theatre of Ireland. He was the head of and one of the founders of the National Theatre of Scotland. He was also one of the co-producers of the Strange Undoing of Prudencia Heart that we had here at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. In general conversation with him, not necessarily in the interview, but in general conversation with him, he grew up in college at the start of the punk rock era in London and saw literally everyone live. Just hearing all of these concerts he's been to, it's such an important part of his life that I couldn't leave that out. Here's my conversation with Neil Murray, and we'll catch up with you after. My name is Neil Murray. I'm a theatre producer and executive director in equal measure, depending on which shirt I'm wearing. But um, yeah, theatre producer primarily. Neil, thank you for joining us today. How did your interest in the arts begin? Arts is one thing and theatre is another, I suppose. But I grew up in a town in South Wales in the UK, which didn't have a theatre. My father was a steel worker. My mother was a shop worker. Great family upbringing, but no real culture wasn't really a part of it. And then as a teenager, I got really interested in music, especially kind of rock, rock music. And I was at the perfect age for when punk rock came to Britain and started. So all around that scene, I went to college in Manchester in England. And the reason I went, to, I did a business degree. I was actually a degree in public administration. It was officially called, which was meant to train me for a life of public service. And when I was in Manchester, I was in bands and music was a huge thing. As part of the, the course, you had to go and work for a year. They used to call them a sandwich degree. So they would sandwich a year of work in between the bread of the, the studying. And I went to London for a year. And while I was in London, I thought, I'm going to the, I'm seeing a lot of music. I'm going to the cinema. I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit interested in visual art. But theatre hasn't really touched me. So I thought, while I'm in London, I should really go to the theatre. You're in the centre of the theatrical world. A bit like in, in New York, they used to have the ticket booth in 
down in Leicester Square where you could turn up, get a ticket that for that night. They were just you know, discounting them to, to fill the houses. So I went down there one night and I got a ticket to see a show called The Accidental Death of an Anarchist by Dario Fo, Italian play in this British premiere with a kind of a radical theatre company doing it. And it just blew me away. It was proper kind of Damascene experience. Like, why haven't I been to the theatre before? And it just felt like everything I was interested in came into one. It was funny and it was political and it was urgent. And I just, I left the theatre and, and it wasn't like, oh, I want to be an actor. It was just, I want to do something to do with that. And after that, I would go to the theatre every week. You know, I would literally pick up a show, go and see it. There was, I saw the original uh, West End production of Educating Rita with Julie Walters in it. Saw Harold Pinter plays. And, you know, I just mixed the whole thing up and I went back to Manchester and finished my degree. But by then I was pretty clear. I was still, I was still doing music and playing and things, but I wasn't, I kind of always knew, I think we weren't going to be good enough. You had to, you know, the, the bar was high. I finished my degree and I started working in the theatre. Uh, various, I worked backstage on stage crew and I worked front of house. I did, you know, whatever the job was. I was in two different theatres. One I was doing front of house, one I was doing backstage. And it became really clear early on, I w I'm not the most practical person. I'm sitting with somebody who is a practical person, so I know this. And um, the best bit of advice I ever got from somebody was I was working on stage crew at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester and really enjoying it because we thought we were rock stars. So the Royal Exchange is a theatre in the round where everybody can see you. So we thought we were cooler than the actors, frankly, on the stage crew. And a brilliant company manager, I think, pulled me aside one day and said, can I have a word? And I thought she was going to say, right, the next job is this. She said, Neil, the thing is, everybody likes you and you're really enthusiastic, but you're dangerous on stage. <laughs> and she was, she, she said, please stay working in theatre, but just not in this area. So I, I, I licked my wounds, really, and I went back to the, uh, the front of house job. And I just worked through that route, really, and became front of house manager. That was my first professional job, was front of house manager. But that experience of having worked backstage was really helpful because I kind of knew at least the language of it all. And I knew what people did. And I think as a producer, you, you tend to bring those things together to try and understand the whole thing. You know, but I always say to people, front of house is a great training if you want to be a producer because you get to see all the work. You often get to meet the artists as well. So I did that really. I was a front of house manager and eventually that led to become general manager. Then all of that other interest I had in music and all those other things suddenly come together and people say, you should be a producer. You, you know, you could, you understand the components of it all which I think you need as a producer. You know, I, don't, I think people who only are obsessed with theatre and not great theatre producers, I think you have to have your eyes open on two other things, whether it's visual art, whether it's cinema, whether it's digital art now particularly. So, yeah, so that's a long story short of how I got into it. And so you became general manager of the theatre in Manchester. This is in Scotland, actually. Okay. I've done a couple of front of house jobs. I've done one in, one in, the first one was actually in Newcastle in the north of England. Then I went back to manage to Manchester and a front of house managed a new art centre and then a job came up at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow which is a very famous producing theatre. I thought I was going to be going for maybe a year to Glasgow but I, I got to Glasgow and I immediately it just I just fell in love with that theatre that city and pretty much all my career with the five years in Dublin which we'll talk about later but it's really been in Glasgow and in Scotland so it was Scotland really that, that kind of made me a theatre producer I think. What was the natural step for you from general manager into a producer role? I think it's semantics in some ways. I think this is back in the mid 90s. The word producer was not really used in subsidized theater. We didn't call ourselves producers. I think there was an embarrassment about it. Producers was what films did and what Broadway did and the West End. You tended to find that if you weren't an artistic director of a company, i.e. you didn't direct the shows yourself, we had less of... Less of that tradition in the UK of just been presenting houses. So you were either a rehearsal room director, directing actors to do plays, or you were the other people in the theatre. The, the lead other person in that theatre was usually the general manager, or even the administrator, they would be called. But in reality, they were doing what we now call producing. So I think I was part of that first generation who slightly put that fear away and said, no, actually, we do produce theatre. That's what we do. And we bring... A creative element to this role it's not it's not an it's not an administrative role so so the first 
just an example, I mean, the first general management job I did was with a company called 784 Theatre Company, which was a kind of touring theatre company in Scotland. The artistic director there was brilliant, but he was incredibly young. You know, he'd just come out of college, really. So he didn't really know anybody. So he didn't know anybody who you could call on to do music in theatre or designers. So I was bringing up, saying, well, what about this person? What about that person? And we had a great working relationship to the extent that he would then look to me to bring ideas into the company as well. So we did a very early production, uh, Frank Galati's version of The Grapes of Wrath, which I'd heard of or I'd seen Steppenwolf doing. And I thought that would be a great show to do in Scotland. It, it speaks to hardship and that kind of political wasteland sometimes that, that gets imposed on areas. I came up with that idea and then we did we did the second ever production of Angels in America. And we didn't have the resource to do it, to be honest. Tony Kushner's agent, when she was convinced that we were going to really honor the script she led us to it ahead of some big companies as well so you start to develop those kind of skills to go well how do you speak to agents how do you negotiate as well as how do you bring ideas how do you bring artists so it, it was a gradual evolution and and now if i'm being really critical i think it's gone too far now i think people come out of drama school and call themselves producers go and usher first go and work on a stage crew don't just think you can walk into the theater to say right we're going to do this show because you, you'll you'll trip up You'll definitely trip up. You're not ready yet. You need to have a much more rounded experience. What would you say the most important characteristic is to being a producer? Primarily, you have to be a listener. I think if you want, if, if as a producer, you want to impose your vision of a show, generally, to me, it doesn't work. I think you have to have the right team around you, whether particularly the director. They have to know you have their back and to know you're going to support them. That doesn't mean you can always support them, and sometimes you have to make tough decisions. But I worked with a brilliant writer-director called Anthony Nielsen in the UK, and Anthony once said, about me, but I think it was about producers generally, at, at an award ceremony where he won, he said he wanted to thank Neil who produced it. He said he's like the perfect producer, he's like the perfect French waiter. You don't know he's there until you need him at your table. And I think that's a good analogy to say that I don't believe that the theatre producer needs to be in the rehearsal room five days a week. That's the director's domain. You're there when the director wants you and the team needs you. If you really want to be that influential on the production, learn to direct. Let the director direct. Your job is to support everybody around the production to make it the best it can be and where appropriate and sometimes crucially give advice and give notes to say that doesn't work and have the relationship with the director where you can do that and the confidence in yourself to do it. And that's the big thing you have to get yourself ready for it. I've worked with some brilliant directors and I worked with John Tiffany who directed Harry Potter now in London but you know we did some a lot of work with the National Theatre of Scotland and I got to a place with John where he would say right Neil I need you to come in and give me your notes. Often he wouldn't even really talk about them but I'd see the show the next day and go oh wow he's he's done them all or he's done eight out of ten of them he's, he's gone yep yeah, that's right we'll change it. So yeah I think I think it's listening Listening, but listening with confidence that when you need to make a change, you can make it. And as producer, you're also part of bringing together the entire creative team for a show. Talk through that process and, and what that looks like and how you get the right fit for the right show. The director, to me, is the fundamental role of a show. That you need to have, you know, once, when, once you have a director, and particularly if it's a new piece of work, that you sit down and you listen with them, you talk to them, once you've, once you've landed on who that person is going to be. Even that's a long process, and that can be a process with a writer often, particularly if I've done a lot of new, new writing, new work, which is incredibly exciting, but also, you know, incredibly risky because nobody knows what it's going to be. That relation, the initial relationship with the writer, how you as the producing company and you as the producer and the writer see the show going. And then who that director is. And once you have that director and then really sit with the director to go, well, who, what does, what does this show need? Because there isn't, to me, there isn't a, you know, there's not just a blueprint that says every show needs a line design and a sound. Some, some shows need extra things. And over the last few years, it's interesting, you know, with looking at your stage today, you know, puppetry was a word that wasn't really used. <laughs> it, was like, it was a really weird thing if you had puppets in a show. Now, because of things like War Horse suddenly it's it's a major component of design and there's you know most show budgets now have a line puppetry or video design is the other one video design 20 years ago was pretty much you know an exception in theater now if if not common it's certainly something that you you, you really consider so i think it's 
it's it's looking at what the show you're going to produce the way you think you want to tell that story whether it's through using different form or whether you go actually no this is a really just straightforward play this is really this needs like people in a room and these people in a room with other people in a room watching them that's what is going to make this brilliant and then i think with with the director it goes back to the thing I said at 784 where, where I worked with a very young director who didn't know people. So I was suggesting people to him. Other times you work with directors who are completely set in their ways, who say, I only want to work with this team of people. And that's brilliant. But sometimes you want to chip away at that and say, well, wouldn't it be great if we brought somebody new in? Maybe even just one of the elements wasn't the same team doing it. A, because I think we need to you know, make sure opportunities exist for younger emerging artists. And secondly, just to mix, just to just to add a, an, an element of risk to it. Otherwise, I think we get go very safe. So I think it's you know it's that bringing your own experience. You know, I have um, I have much to my family's dismay. I have trunks and trunks of theatre programs. I, you know, I used to keep every time I went to theatre, I kept the program. Maybe once a year, I just take a day to go back through them, just to go. Is there anybody I haven't thought of who I worked with in the past? Just to remind myself of people. So I think, you know, keeping that, keeping it fresh and whilst always calling on those people you can rely on, and, you know, and there's a real temptation to do that, to go, well, I know I can make it with these people. But then knowing when the right time is to bring somebody new in, having met somebody different, they would be brilliant to do this. So it's a, you know, it's a balance. Let's talk about National Theatre of Scotland. You were one of the founders of the National Theatre of Scotland in 2005. Where was that birthed from? And what was the process to then found and start the National Theatre of Scotland? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a really interesting story. And it, it's, it's partly, it partly came from political expediency and partly from a creative urge and the thing. So, so what happened is that Scotland... It's part of the United Kingdom, is now what's called a devolved nation. So we don't have full independence, but since 1998, there's been a kind of a, a devolved Scotland, which means we have some tax raising powers, we have some autonomy from London. What's interesting about Scotland it, it, culturally was that it had its own opera company, had its own ballet company, had its own national galleries. So it, it had an infrastructure around culture, but what it didn't have was a national theatre. And the National Theatre in London was called the National Theatre of Great Britain. That's what its official title is, the Royal National Theatre of Great Britain. And, I, you know, and I'd, um, I'd done some work down there from Scotland. I'd taken shows from Scotland to London. And so, so, you know, it, it, it didn't it wasn't entirely alien from Scotland, but it didn't really feel like it was our national theatre. They, you know, they they toured very rarely to Scotland. You really had to go to, to London to see them. When devolution happens in Scotland in the late nineties, suddenly the politicians start to go, well, how can what can we do to make a mark? They land on theatre because there isn't a national theatre. At the same time, the desire for a huge new theatre building is, is not huge for two reasons. One, the politici politicians themselves have built this new parliament building in Edinburgh, which somebody budgeted it on the back of an envelope. So they basically scrolled, oh, we are going to, we're going to build a new parliament building for Scotland and it's going to cost £40 million. That was their budget. It ended up costing £400 million. And, and it was completely wrapped up in problems and issues. Everybody was very worried to go, oh, let's build another public building in Scotland. So, so and, and, and what happened, the theatre people themselves had all got together because we could see this come in. And at this point, I was the director of a theatre in Glasgow called the Tron Theatre that was both a producing and presenting house. We all got together and said, the last thing we need is another theatre building. We're struggling to fill these. We have big buildings in Glasgow, in Edinburgh especially, but also other cities in Aberdeen, in Inverness, in Perth, all around Scotland. Where actually, what if, instead of all the money that it takes to run a resource, whether it's utilities, whether it's staffing, why don't we create what somebody came up with as a theatre without walls? That was the expression, theatre without walls, which would mean you would have a national theatre that, and there was a huge argument where it should be, but eventually Atlanta would be in Glasgow, that would be based in Glasgow, but would not have its own theatre building. It would have, at some point, and now it does have a, a resource centre, I suppose, but initially it was just offices, office space. And we'll use all our relationships with the other companies to make work there. My involvement was the, the inaugural director of the National Theatre was a woman called Vicky Featherstone, was appointed in, I think, August 2004. As an and Vicky was an artistic director. She was a rehearsal room director. She'd 
She'd run a company called Payne's Plough in England, which was a big new writing company. I knew Vicky because her work had come to the Tron. We were in the same world. So Vicky was appointed basically on her own. It was the National Theatre, I think, started on the 5th of November 2004 with Vicky Featherstone and a PA and a mobile phone in an office. That was it. And suddenly she had to put this team together. She called me, asked me if I would be interested in coming to work with her as the kind of producer or the executive director stroke executive producer. I can't remember which language we were using at that point. And to be honest, at that point, I was still at the Tron and we were doing really great things and we were about to do some international work. Just had a kid and I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm kind of good here for a bit longer. I said, no, honestly, thank you. I'm not going to go for it, but thank you. Good luck. I always remember, I think it was Christmas Eve. It was the last working day of the year, pretty much. And I knew they'd been interviewing for the job, but I was kind of going, you know, maybe I should have. And my phone rang when we still had desk phones that rang. When people used to ring us on desk phones. <clears throat> and it was Vicky. And she said, look, I know you said no, but we've been interviewing people today. We saw some really good people, but I really need you to come and do this. Mm. You know, I need, you, you have the specific experience and knowledge of Scotland that I'm going to need. Would you do it? And I said, oh, Vicky, don't do this. And I met her for coffee. And I said, OK, so then I had to be interviewed and that and, and it happened. So I was one of the first three or four people who started it. And we started in, um, so I joined in April 2005. We had a good budget. The government at that point, I think, were given four million pounds, which seems like an enormous amount of money. Where I come from a theatre that was operating on much less money. But we had very little time to do anything because people were anxious. Well, well, now you're here, what are you going to do? And the drawback of not having your own theatre is you've got to negotiate every Every show has to be negotiated, every space. You know, I, I would say there's there's 80% advantage to not being shackled by a building, but the 20% downsize of that is you don't get to schedule that building, you don't get to decide when you do what. We worked like crazy to put together a program of work for our first year, which would be 2006, and we started producing in, I think, March to February, March 2006. It went well, it's t you know, some of the work really landed some didn't but there was a sense of excitement and actually even the first project we did we called home because we didn't have a home and what we did was we chose 10 locations all over scotland that would have an event on the same night and they all happened at the same time as well so it meant that the critics couldn't even see them all you could you had to choose one and you know one person managed to see four i think in a day by driving around or whatever but it felt like a really great statement. We were doing, we were trying to be slightly romantic to go. It's, it's like old school of a beacon on a, a flame on a hill, seen by the next one, seen by the next one. So we did these 10 shows. Then we started making work, some in theatres, some site specifically. And then we were really, uh, I mean, the thing that changed the whole journey of the National Theatre of Scotland was a show called Black Watch. Vicky had commissioned on her first day in the job when the first thing she did was to call up a playwright called Gregory Burke, who she'd worked with previously. And Greg had written a play called Gagarin Way. And she said, and she said to Greg, she, she'd read the newspaper, the, the Herald newspaper in Glasgow had two contrasting stories about the Scottish army. This is when the Iraq war was on. One was that Tony Blair was planning to amalgamate all of the Scottish regiments into one. In the past, every regiment had its own identity, you know, and it was really fiercely loyal and local. So the Black Watch, for example, are from Fife, and your father was in it, and his grandfather. And they were going to, they were kind of threatening to get rid of that, what they call the golden thread that takes you back into just one because of bureaucracy, basically. So it wouldn't be cheaper if we just had one regiment. And there was, there was already uproar about this from the regiments. And on the second page, or the next story, was three Black Watch soldiers that had been killed by um, a device at the side of the road. They'd been blown up, checking a car. And she thought, God, there's something in that story. That one is, they're out there doing this awful job. And at the same time, they're being undermined by the government. So she phoned Greg and said, would you keep an eye on that story and he said i don't need to keep an eye on it i'm living in dunfilm and i can see it the soldiers are coming back from iraq they're not being decompressed properly they're being given pocketfuls of money they're fighting it's it's chaos so we he we managed to find somebody to get for him to be able to interview the soldiers so we made this show called black watch which was based on interviews with soldiers from the regiment coming back to scotland as well as documentary footage of when they were out there and you know it, it was kind of verbatim theatre in that it was, it was documentary, but not strictly so. It was incredibly theatrical. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier as well. I mean, what made it theatrical was the music was extraordinary. It had movement in it. A guy called Stephen Hoggett, who's a choreographer, did Harry Potter. Stephen did. There was like a ballet moment in it where these soldiers suddenly start moving in a different, in a way that 
people couldn't comprehend. It had some video art in it. All the things came together. It was a proper piece of where the sum of its parts was much bigger than the whole of it. Or the whole was bigger than the sum of its parts. And we opened it in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Fringe, and we really didn't know what was going to be like. We, I mean, we'd, I'd seen a rehearsal where I said, the only thing we've got to do here is not fuck this up. I was in the rehearsal room. I was like in bits. I was like, this is like... This is the most extraordinary piece of storytelling I've ever seen. And we did it in a, what we would call a drill hall um, in, in Edinburgh, which was a hall that had been used previously for soldiers to, you know, train in. We opened at the Edinburgh Fringe and it was a sensation from the first performance. People were like, this is changing theatre, it's changing how we do theatre, how we see theatre. And I think when you're in the middle of that, you don't see that. You're just making a show and you're panicking. I was panicking because it was costing so much money. I was like, what if it doesn't work? And it worked. Literally within hours, people were phoning us and saying, can it come to Australia? Can it come to America? It accelerated the growth of the company hugely. And it gave us the confidence to become an international theatre company in year one. I think we had a plan was by year five, we'll be an international theatre company. And Black Watch opened in August 2006. I think September 2007, we had a show called The Wolves in the Walls, a children's show by Neil Gaiman at the New Victory Theatre in New York. And Black Watch opened at UCLA in Los Angeles at their festival, and then came to St. Anne's Warehouse straight afterwards. So we had these two international shows immediately. And I should talk about Michael Mashala's role in that, and that Michael was somebody who I knew when I was at the Tron, and we talked about working together at the Tron. He'd seen a show I'd made and really loved. When the National Theatre of Scotland started, him and I talked about him acting as an agent for us. So he was able to quickly unlock doors in terms of relationships, particularly in the kind of not-for-profit world and particularly around the um, university kind of circuit in, in the United States. So he was instrumental in making these relationships for us. By the time I, I left NTS, I was there for 10 years. So, so I left in 2016. And I think we'd done 25 international tours by that point. And that was a lot in the United States, but also Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, China, Japan, some in Europe. Less in Europe because of language, strangely. Europe, some, Europe tends to do this. Europe tends to take the work themselves and translate it and do it in their own production. They're not so interested in seeing English language production. So some, some, we did some work in Poland and Ireland. Um, yeah, and it was an amazing adventure. It was an amazing adventure. And um, I think we changed the way people think of national theatres. So other people now have taken that model to say, you don't need a big building to be a national theatre. In fact, they hold you back. You were potentially going to be five years out, but the, the work itself called for it to become an international touring company quickly. Yeah. What is the difference in scaling from a national tour company within Scotland to an international tour company shipping shows out to around the world. Where's What is the shift like from both a business and a logistics standpoint? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a culture shock. It's a, you know, you need... I mean, we had a brilliant technical director at National Theatre of Scotland, a guy called Neil Black, who'd worked with uh, Theatre de Complicité. So he had international tour and experience. So he'd done the carny, he'd done all of those things. The biggest thing was the growth in the company. You know, but at, at the end of our first year, I remember we went for a, a Christmas dinner or something, Christmas lunch... In, at the end of 2005, and there were seven of us. At the end of 2006, there were 13 of us. At the end of 2007, there were 40 of us. So you're bringing people in because you need them people to act as producers, to work logistics, to work travel, work accommodation, work freight. It's not something you can just do on your own. It's something that it needs support around it. And I think there's a danger to try and run before you can walk sometimes with that. And I've seen it with other companies who are like, it's exciting when people invite you to tour internationally. It's, you know, it's, it's what you've worked for. It's like, great. But then you've got to make sure it happens. And that's the tough bit. That's the tougher bit is, is everything that goes with it. There's a show we, we have here in your theatre. It's a very particular example of that. That's a kind of, it's a weird hybrid show of a show that was really made for very small local touring in Scotland. I don't think there was ever any thought this would be an international show. It's like, it's so Scottish. Although maybe that's the interesting thing. Maybe that's, that was the same with Black Watch. I, I think sometimes those shows that you make that are, are, are very local actually become universal. They're the ones that people go, oh, yeah, we, we have a similar thing to that. Well, and that's one, one thing that we experienced with bringing Prudencia, the strange undoing of Prudencia Heart into the theater was that it, it garnered an audience of people who have a sentimentality towards Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, we had people show up in kilts and we had people... Tamashanta yesterday. Um, for the first time ever, mm. um, for our bar sales, all of the sales were primarily within Scotch and Guinness and we sold very few standard domestic beers. Yeah. And we've never had that for a bar sale for a show, but people were coming for that authentic experience. Yeah. 
and in turn they embodied it and and were invested in the art of Scotland before the show even started. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that's yeah, I think you know people have a romantic attachment to, to Scotland. Some most people, a lot of people have some kind of vague oh, I have ancestry not as much as Ireland. The Irish claim everybody. <laughs> the Scots are not as good as, as the Irish are doing it. But there is that. But, but, but I think there's also something about stories about small places. You know, Brensia Hard is, you know, Kelso is a tiny little town in, in the borders of Scotland. And I think people can relate to small community stories as well. You know, it doesn't have to be about New York. It doesn't have to be about London. I think people like that sense of, oh, it's a world that I can imagine myself. And that was true of Blackwatch, which was, it was like where those soldiers were from was like, you know, a one pub town. So, yeah, we know that town. I can imagine those soldiers coming back. We, when we did it in the US, we, we did it in Virginia Arts Festival. I've forgotten the name of the military base, huge base. You know, the reason we did it there was, was because the army were going to support it. They then read the script and went, we can't, <laughs> are you joking? This is critical of the US government. This is critical of foreign policy. We can't do that. It was going to be a disaster because, you know, that was going to be the audience. But what happened was the soldiers themselves found out it was on and started coming. And it was nowhere near as busy as other places we'd done it. We were in this, on a basketball court, I remember it. But, but, you know, I remember one particular soldier, a family coming. First of all, the soldier came on his own. Next day he came back with his father, or an older man, and I'd seen him and I just went up and said, I, I can't help noticing that you were here yesterday. Well. He, said, he said, this is the closest I can get to telling my family what it's like. He said, I can't talk to them about what we do, what I did. Is too. But this gives them a sense of what it's like because of the production, the way the camaraderie, the danger. And the next day he brought his wife and his kids. And that's what's happening. And Because there was people seeing their own story told. Which is, un, which is rare. In theatre, we don't often see that. But when you go, actually, they can tell my story better than I can because, you know, that's what, you know, I don't want to talk about what happened to me, but these people can do it. This gives you a sense of what, of what I went through. And I think that's when theatre really connects, whether it's with the community, whether it's with people's identity. In my experience, whenever I've tried to be, or I've been involved in a project, there was a little thought in the back of the head goes, this, this could be really massive. <laughs> it invariably fails. Mm -hmm invariably fails the shows that come out of nowhere are the ones that succeed because something just happens magically and you can't can't make you, you can't force it it's got to just happen and often those stories are, are stories that you make thinking this is going to have very limited interest and accessibility for people but it turns into something and Prudencia hard has been that you know we we started doing that show in a bar in Glasgow in 2011 if you'd said to me then 12 years later you'd be in Illinois <laughs> yeah with it in a, in a rural farming town in southern in Illinois. In a rural farm town where it sells out, where people just get it and love it, with a new company of people doing it. So it's it's, it's refreshing itself through the, this cast who are amazing and new. I would have said, you're crazy. You know, why, why would we be doing that? You never know where it's going to go. And, and I think that's the brilliance of the theater industry as a whole is nothing is secure. Nothing is a safe bet yeah. at any point. Yeah. Let's move on. So you were with... National Theatre of Scotland mm -hmm. for 10 years. Yeah. And then you went to the National Theatre of Ireland. Yeah. Hmm. What was the difference culturally and, yeah. and experience-wise yeah. in making that change? And you were, in, you were based in Dublin there. Yeah, yeah I moved to Dublin. Um, the reason I, NTS, I, I, I genuinely think that for producing theatre companies, 10 years is just kind of your lifespan. I think somebody else needs to come and change it and refresh it. And I, I'd done 10 years in my previous job at the Tron. I'd done 10 years at NTS. So I need you to do something else. Vicky had left, the artistic director who I'd gone in with had left to go to the Royal Court Theatre in London. And there was a new artistic director who was great, but, you know, I think he needed to have his own people as well. So I was looking for something, and it was hard to think what there was going to be in Scotland after the National Theatre, and the Abbey Theatre in Dublin came up. And I had, you know, I'd been to the Abbey a few times. It's a very famous theatre in terms of, it's one of the few theatres in the world where you say Abbey and people go Dublin. It's, you know, Ireland has a national theatre before it has a nation. It's the opposite to Scotland. The Abbey's founded in 1904 when Ireland is still part of the United Kingdom. You know, this, and in the 1916 uh, Easter Rising, first person to be killed in the civil, what becomes the Civil War is an actor from the Abbey Theatre. So it's rooted in that story. Sean O'Casey wrote the plan. It was the home of Sean O'Casey, home of J.M. Singh. There have been more riots at the Abbey Theatre than any other theatre in the world. They rioted Playboy of the Western World, the world premiere of that in 1907, because they felt that Singh was insulting 
the rural people of Ireland. They rioted at the Plough and the Stars, which was uh, in 23, actually, it was written up about the rising because they felt that, they felt that O'Casey, um, he portrayed the rebels as basically drunks who didn't know what they were doing and, and people got insulted by them and rioted again. There's a whole politics around the Abbey, but it had kind of... It had kind of got a bit moribund. I felt. I was looking at it as program and thinking, God, they're still doing those plays. They're still doing those plays all the time as well. Myself and a colleague, Graham McLaren, who'd been associate director at the National Theatre of Scotland, we'd done a lot of work together there, particularly more, a lot of the camera, more react, responsive work to things. We just said, oh, why don't we just put an application? It might be fun. And I think we genuinely thought, because of our experience of the National Theatre of Scotland, they might say, well, look, come and do a bit of consultancy work for us. You know, we might get a, you know, enough for a holiday out of it or something. And we went across and we were interviewed three, two, three times and they went, no, we want you to do it. So it, it was, a, I mean, it was, it was a big story in Ireland because we were the first non-Irish people to run the Abbey. Go back to your question, what was the experience like? I mean, I think we underestimated that. I think, I think everybody underestimated. I think the Irish underestimated how they would feel about it. I think there was a sense of, well, I, I'm, you say I'm Welsh, Graham's Scottish, so we're Celts. We both had Irish connections through marriage or through family. So there was a sense of, well, they're, they're almost Irish. And actually, you can never be Irish enough to run the Abbey, is, is the reality of it. And we had a great time in lots of ways, and we, re we really changed the theatre. We, we, we opened it up. There was a real sense that there had been a kind of a shutter at the Abbey where you couldn't get in unless you were so... It was a very small number of people got to work at the Abbey, either as writers. To be a writer, you pretty much had to be dead. And dead quite a long time to be at the Abbey. And, and actors were, there was a kind of a, almost a dynasty of families who, who, who would generally be working there. So younger actors, younger theatre makers felt completely shut out. So we changed that immediately by, the pro, by, by saying to the programme, we're going to do a programme which is not just produced work, because it, it was pretty much all self-produced work. So we're going to invite other companies in. So we invited companies like Druid, who are an amazing Irish theatre company, who you know, did the original Beauty Queen of Lenan. We're going to invite companies like Landmark, who work with um, Killian Murphy and very quickly the whole mood of the place changed half of the theatre community loved that and the half who didn't really fucking hated it because they suddenly weren't there anymore and it became divisive in the end it became a battle and you know letters were written to the Irish Times that we were you know we were co-producing with people and not paying people it was all not true it was really about it became a battle of, of wills about should the Abbey just reflect what What's happened in Ireland in the past? I should have looked forward. We did five years, and COVID came in the middle, and we and we we actually had a really good COVID. We, you know, we it was interesting talk, talking to you the other night, Josh. You know about what you, what you did during COVID, and we did similar things. We we took we saw it as an opportunity to give people employment, keep people working. So we won a lot of points for COVID, but in the end, the five years was up, and I think the board had kind of and we'd kind of suddenly went maybe that's the time but what i'm proud of is that the abbey that's currently now is it's got two irish directors now we broke the model we it's, it's it looks very different now to when it did seven years ago for example it was a great experience i wouldn't have missed it for the world well, you know what an honor to be director of the abbey theater and i still have a lot of connections in ireland but it, it was also tough that sense of you're not from this culture no matter how close you think you might be to it. And I don't think that's healthy for Ireland, but it's something they're battling with in a sense. But some great work came out of it as well. And so was there like a sense of how dare you become the, the curator of the voice of yeah. the National Theatre of, of Ireland when you don't know the experience? Yeah, absolutely. There was, a, there was quite a lot of that from an, from an older generation especially. It, it was like, who are these people, you know, coming in here? And because we said very deliberately that we weren't going to just replicate the canon. So we said, we're going to have a moratorium. We are not going to do the play on the stars. You know, there had been, there had been three, three productions of, the, of that play, which was written in 1923. Three productions of the play on the stars in seven years before we got there. Three new productions. Every time spent in another chain. It's like, how many times do people want to see the play on the stars? You know, and so that kind of made people say, what they said was, oh, they don't respect the canon. I said, we do respect the canon, but it's a canon for a reason. It's older and you need to be refreshing it and replacing it. You know, we did, before we left, we did a great production or we set up a great production of Faith Healer by Brian Friel, which was quite starry cast. So we were doing, we were doing things. We did Ulysses by James Joyce. So it wasn't, we weren't doing Irish work. But it wasn't all the time. It was also saying we're going to bring in companies from other parts of the world to come here. We're going to co-produce with people. And that was what was different. And people, I think, struggled. Although I'm hopefully, I'm hopeful that history will redeem us and say, no, actually, that, that was a fundamental shift in the Abbey, which was healthy. Um, and I think it's where the program is now as well. To be someone that 
that bucks a hundred year old tide um, and say, we're going to change things here. Never really wins you that many friends No, um, with, with people that are yeah. following the establishment itself, yeah. despite the fact that things have to change and evolve to continue and to stay relevant. The old guard never appreciates yeah. it. And somebody has to change it. And I, all I would say though, is I think we underestimated the influence of that older guard. And I think that's about Ireland's relationship with its media, with its universities, all of those things. I think we underestimated that and thought, no, people are going to go, this is great. They're going to love it. And a lot of people did. And the theater was busier than it ever been. And we did it. We did some international, we started an international tour. And again, we did a play called Two Pints, which was a, a, to be frank, we ripped off the Prudencia. It was like it was a show in a pub. He said, we know, we know how to do shows in pubs. Let's do a show in a pub. By Roddy Doyle, who wrote The Commitments. And Roddy wrote this wonderful thing about two men started a bar talking about life and death. And we toured that in America. We did a play called Cypress Avenue that had happened before we'd got to the Abbey. But we loved it. So, again, we didn't have any, you know, I don't have any of that kind of weird possession of like, well, I can't do another regime produce that show. I don't care if it's brilliant, do it. So we did, we took Cypress Avenue to the public theater in New York for eight weeks or 12 weeks and did a few other things. We got the Abbey, I think, back on the front foot, but it came at a price. From there, you've moved on and you've become an independent producer. Stumbled into it, really. I mean, I, I left the Abbey and I felt like between the Tron National Theatre of Scotland, the Abbey, that's 25 years of either CEO in or deputy CEO, you know, feeling like you're running something. And I just thought, I don't really want to go straight back into running another organisation. A few things came up. I did some interim exec directing for a th big theatre in England. My relationship with Michael Michalis continued. So Michael and I were aware that the National Theatre of Scotland had kind of given up the rights to Prudencia Heart. And Michael's always really loved the show. So he said... Why don't we try and get the rights, see what we can do? So we did. We managed to secure the English speaking rights for a period of time. And we produced it in Edinburgh at the Fringe in the summer, where it went really well. And this it still showed there was an appetite for it, both in Scotland, but also wider and, and in the United States. So here we are at the end of week one of a 12 week engagement, initial 12 week engagement, and then maybe some more later on, perhaps. And yeah, starting to look at other projects now as well. That we might might start doing and yeah it's, it's interesting and it goes back a little to something you said earlier about what's it like from being like a scottish tour to an international tour and it's like what's it like being going from being executive producer of a, of a national theater to an independent producer on your own and it's different it's very different you know you, you a lot of the skill sets are the same but you also have to just be more you're on the ground a lot more you're on the ground a lot more that you're doing much more day-to-day -day responsibility and that's great you're closer to the work you're closer to the work, which is great. Um, but no, it's terrific. So now I'm, yeah, I'm looking to see what I might do next, but hopefully Prudential will continue. And I'm still, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy to to be asked because of my experience now, which is, it's weird in theatre. You kind of go from enfant terrible to eminence grease very quickly. And I seem to have made the shift. So now people say, oh, would you come and do some consultancy work? I'm like, okay, yeah, why not? So, yeah, so so really, you know, I, I kind of want to do a basket of things, really. Some producing, but really happy to do some mentoring, to do some consultancy work. And, uh, yeah, just keep working in theater, though. Neil, thank you for your time with us today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for opening up your experiences to us, both with both of the national theaters and how you got to that point. It's been really enlightening and just a pleasure to hear. Thanks, Josh. Thanks to you and all your team here at the Theatre in Marion, who've been amazing this week. We could not have picked a better, warmer place to start the show, both in terms of the audience, but also you and your team, how you've really engaged with what we're doing here. So um, we, we set off with a spring in our step. So thank you. Josh, what a fantastic conversation with Neil. I did have the pleasure of meeting Neil at your venue when we saw The Strange Undoing of Prudencia Heart. Crazy enough, I actually had the opportunity to see Two Pints, the show he talks about uh, producing in Dublin while I was in Dublin that year. And it was a show that to this day is one of the two best pieces of theater I have ever ever seen. The other one being the strange undoing of Prudencia Hart. So clearly he's got a bit of a Midas touch in what he chooses to, you know, be a part of and, and help create um, because just really some impressive performances and just an impressive history that he has. I mean, really kind of 
shaping the theater industry and theater world in both Ireland and Scotland. Like what a, what an impressive resume. Yeah. I feel like I'm missing out. I was really intrigued by his story about black watch and what he was saying about the soldiers yeah. coming to, to bring their families back to see it. And it just made me want to see that piece or any of his work as well. Yeah. I think the idea of reflecting experience on stage in a very intentional way, like Neil has done throughout his career and creation of new work is really intriguing. And it's something that we do very piecemeal here in the U.S. And I'll say too, like as a municipal presenter, I do think a lot about on the stage, are we reflecting the experience of the people that live there or are we bringing the highest quality, excellent art, diverse groups of performers to our community? For me as a municipal presenter, we're a very, very rural area. And so I like to see within our programming a lot of reflections of some of the more urban spaces in the United States and, and what that brings in um, and, and kind of open a window into the rest of the United States and to the rest of the world through the programming. The thing about building the National Theater of Scotland, which honestly sounds so intimidating, <laughs> you know, just by the constraint of what was happening in that area of like just the the desire to build another public building was super low, but making a national theater that doesn't have its own space, to me, that makes sense. Um, but I'm certain that that's not like the first thing that we talked about. And I think so many of us have experience with like theater in non-traditional settings or theater outdoors. And in the pandemic, a lot of us did that. I just really love the idea of a national theater that doesn't stay in the same place. I love that they were launching a national theater, but in launching a national theater, they decided, you know what? Let's put on 10 performances in 10 different places simultaneously yeah. to launch. Like, it's not a big enough thing that we're launching a national theater, but let's literally launch 10 productions separately all at the exact same time. That couldn't be that hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, it's like the ultimate way of saying to the people of that nation, like, this is for you. We are going to continually bring you great art and we are doing this for you. It is not just for a select group of people who live in Edinburgh, who can afford to come to our to our venue because we have all this overhead. We have all this cost. Like, that's what really struck me about that story was like, it really was taking the art to the people in that moment and ensuring that everyone knew this is for you. This is something that you can be proud of too and we're going to bring it to your community i think that's a hugely important thing to keep in mind thinking about access and thinking about who are we actually making art for is like making those statements those very profound statements um, in the choices that we make in terms of who we're performing for where we're performing where we're mounting work those sorts of things yeah and without saying it too that's a really equitable um decision that was made i found it fascinating his story about taking over the Abbey. And while it may not have gone as smoothly because he, they saw him as other, as not belonging, but the story of the impact of after he left and how it's made the Abbey better. And even though he's no longer there in charge of it, it's continued to open up uh, what they're able to do now. And, and that was kind of helpful for me too, to, to look back at places where that I've left in my career and I've always kind of had a sadness each time I departed one place to go to a new one because I'm like, oh, what am I going to, I'm leaving this and now it's not going to be, you know, what I built. But, you know, hearing Neil and thinking about it, it's like, yeah, well, I, I probably opened up some doors my time there to help the next person do what it is that they want to take it to. I think, Brian, what you're talking about and what Neil talked about really struck me was everything is kind of tied up um, in the idea of legacy, right? He made a note uh, that after ten, he thinks it's really healthy to leave a space after 10 years, right? You've kind of done what you need to do. And for the organization's sake, like people need to move on. I think that's really healthy and really wise. And seemed to me, at least he was doing that in a way, moving from place to place, job to job, that he was doing it without ego. And he's not concerned necessarily for his legacy, right? He's done the work, he's confident in the work and can move on to something else. In the story about the National Theater of Ireland, the Abbey, like there's seemed to me a lot of concern of legacy, right? The canon and these stories, these shows that have been produced over and over and over again, and that history is so important, but then also like, what is the new legacy? And he mentioned opening doors for younger artists and emerging talent and things like that. So like, what is the legacy of this moment moving forward? And you do, we do need those change makers. We do need those folks that are 
not scared <laughs> to like to really make a change because as Neil's story proves, 50% of people are going to agree with you. 50% of people are not going to agree with you. There is no winning that. Um, so just how brave can we be for the sake of our communities and our art and pushing things forward in the direction that is necessary for it to survive? And I really liked what he said about bringing in people new and making room for new talent in in as a producer, you know, pushing directors to bring in a new creative member of their team each time and, and to change up their team a little bit to make way for, for new and younger people to come up in the industry. Well, thank you guys uh, for your feedback here and for, for your thoughts on the episode. Neil, thank you for sitting down with us and being part of There's No Business Like. We'll see all of y'all next time. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslike.com. Do I sound out bus i -ness every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Josh, this question is like got to be the most difficult yet because it's like asking which is your favorite kid. And yeah, of course you have one, but you don't want to say it out loud. <laughs> All right, so which one's your favorite kid, Brian? <laughs> I'm only kidding. That's, that's not true. And seeing NSYNC like blew my mind. Are we the same person? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the best moment of my life. Oh, no, it's either that. There's also a Hanson. Con <laughs> There's also a Hanson concert. Man, between Hanson and Sync and Jane Monheit, I can't imagine who would be the best mu musician. Hmm. You didn't ask best musician. You asked favorite concert. Will anyone write us? <laughs> <laughs>